Louis, tell me about a partisan's daughter. It would have been the first novel I wrote, ever wrote if I published it. Um, back in about 1979, I, I shared a house, a derelict house, in Archway with um, several other people. I was pretending to be someone else who'd gone to Kathmandu on the hippie trail, and I, I took over his room for the purposes of the rent book, because it saved trouble. And in, in that house there was a woman from Serbia who um, said that she had been working in a hostess club and that she'd earned so much money that she'd been able to retire. She'd stashed it all in a trunk under her bed. And she she um, was a scary woman, but, but very interesting. And I, I was fond of her. She, she used to get hold of me when I got back from work and just tell me her stories. And w when I finally left the house, I wrote all the stories down instead of doing my teacher training essays. And I thought, well, this is my first novel. But unfortunately, a novel can't consist of just a series of anecdotes. It has to have a plot. And so 28 years later and seven drafts later, I have sort of turned it into a novel by bringing in this um, dejected medical salesman called Chris, um, who, who is the person in the story who listens to her stories rather than me. And um, th th that way I hope to keep the reader interested because they want to know what happens to the relationship. Um, so that's, that's what it is. It's actually rooted in my personal history. Did you have to go back and research the Yugoslavian story? I had to do quite a lot of research about Yugoslavia because I, didn't, I couldn't really trust my memory as to what um, the original woman had told me. And so I did things like read, you know, a concise history of the Yugoslav peoples and that kind of thing. Um, did it help? Very much so, yes, because it, it's actually, the Balkans are very confusing politically. You have so many ethnic and religious divisions, um, all, all with their bitter histories. And it's quite hard to understand. So, so you have to put in the work to make sure you've got everything sorted out. I mean, you even had to work out in your mind where Bosnia is relative to Croatia, all that sort of stuff. And uh, also, just when I had nearly finished the book, I did go to um, Serbia, and um, it, was, it was actually to publicise Birds Without Wings. And while I was there, I checked out um, things that I thought I ought to know, like, how do you say, I thought you loved me, in Serbo-Croat, you know, and, and what, what names people are likely to have. Rosa, for example, is not common anymore in Serbia. It's a very old-fashioned name but I found out that it's spelt with a Z and not with an S. So I, I did that kind of research. I mean, the 70s is a, is a fairly doldrum time to write about. Did you have a struggle with that? I didn't have a struggle with writing about it because it, that, that was my own youth. I, I, f I feel, in retrospect, that I grew up at the worst possible time that there was to be young and British. It was fantastically depressing being British. Everybody was on strike all the time. Inflation was rocketing. The, the Chancellor of the Exchequer had been to the IMF to borrow money, and um, it seemed that we were rapidly going down the tubes. You know, a lot of us um, were expecting a revolution of some sort. I mean, the, the, the people on the left especially were expecting a revolution. It still seemed possible. Um, and it was a time when I, a, a kind of grim-faced feminism had just kicked in as well. So, so the intelligent women were doing their very best not to look beautiful. If, if you told an intelligent woman she was beautiful, she took it as an insult. You know, it took me years and years to get out of that mindset. Um, in fact, a South American friend, she reproached me. She said, why have you never told me I'm beautiful? And I thought, oh, well, yes, it's because of the bloody 1970s. My father had two Allegros, one after the other. Well, the first edition, I believe, had a square steering wheel. I seem to remember that. But both of these new cars, the first day they turned up, they had to be jump-started off my Morris Minor. Other than that, they were fairly satisfactory family cars, I thought. So it's fashionable to mock them now. Um, but one of my dad's cars was this ghastly shade of dark brown, which gave me the idea for the ship brown Allegro. The great white loaf, on the other hand, it's what Chris calls his wife, and she, there are several origins to the Great White Loaf. I mean, 
in the sense that we, all, we have all at one time or another experienced a really awful relationship going downhill. And um, I, I had a friend who took in a lodger to, to earn some extra money. And this woman, I swear, did absolutely nothing except sit on the sofa and get fatter and fatter. And we, we referred to her as the great white loaf. And I always wanted to use this phrase in a book. Because you, you, know, you know the white loaves that you get in England, which are sort of stodgy and sliced thinly, and they don't stand up if you put them on the table. They just sort of go, go like that. And uh, she, she just reminded us of a white loaf wrapped up in cellophane. Um, but, I mean, there are other origins for a, a character like that. I once met a Spanish policeman in a bar in Malaga. And he wasn't an alcoholic, but he spent every, every evening, all evening, in this bar. And he, he, he showed me, his, he took out his wallet and he showed me a picture of his wife. And, he, and she was a sort of great white loaf. You could tell she was fat and bad-tempered. And he, he said, that's the reason I never go home. <laughs>